All right. Our mothers deserve that and much more. If you'll stand all together now, I've asked Brother Tim Tremley to come minister to us today. I thought it would be very fitting. Uh, this year, Hannah was born, and Hannah's got a lot of attention, not just because she was born late in their life, but because she's symbolic of what God's wanting to do in this region. And we've taken time to celebrate. Uh, we don't want to over shadow grace and others are, Hannah's not more valuable as a human being than that but as a body we're trying to embrace what God is telling us that God's going to work miracles but every one of these children is, is beautiful and wonderful but uh, since this is the first year that uh, Michelle gets to enjoy Mother's Day as a mother uh, I thought it would be very fitting if her husband preached to us today so come and minister I'd like to throw my two cents worth in for mothers also. And I'd like to ask all the mothers if you could please come up here. We want to pray for you. Um, it is exciting uh, to have my wife. Technically, I guess she was a mother last year too, but the baby just was still in her womb. <laughs> kind of like the church. But she's a mother now, and I'm, it's exciting, and it's challenging, and it's life-changing. But I'm thankful for mothers because if it wasn't for mothers, none of us would be here. And we're living in a messed up culture. We're living in a culture that wants to redefine even gender or marriage. So if that passes, well, how are you going to celebrate Mother's Day? Was it going to be Happy Partner's Day? Or I don't mean to be so controversial or offensive, but I don't believe that lie. I'm not being controversial. You know what's controversial and offensive is when they bring the agenda that is contrary to words to the God, word of God and try to force our culture to accept it. That's controversial. But I'm thankful that we have a church full of mothers. You have a very important role, and even more so now than ever because of our culture. Uh, you are a special troop in God's army. Because all soldiers are target for attack. Isn't that encouraging? But that's just a fact of being a soldier in God's army. But mothers are targeted in, in a different way than fathers are, in a different way than men are. So I'm going to ask the rest of the church to come and stand behind these mothers, whether it's your mother or if you're her husband or her son, her niece, her nephew, we're going to pray for them that God would strengthen them. It specifically strengthen them against the lies of the accuser. Because he's perpetrating a lot of lies through our culture that would mess with women's minds. He's really messed with a lot of people's minds. But the church is in a different place than the rest of the world. We're, fa we're facing a battle that the world's not facing as far as in the spirit realm. So let's pray for strength on these mothers, spiritual strength, physical strength, emotional strength, every kind of strength that God puts on your heart. Let's just pray right now for these mothers. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. I thank you, God, and for every mother here, Lord Jesus. And God, I, I pray your strength, Lord Jesus, in, in their lives and in their hearts in their bodies, Lord, as they raise up children in this day and age, Lord Jesus. God, that you would strengthen them. Lord, that you would bless them, God, and help them to see the role that you've given them as a gift from you. God, that you will equip them for the task, Lord, that you will empower them, Lord Jesus. I pray specifically against the lies of the accuser, uh, against the conformity of this culture, Lord, that would uh, try to persuade them to let down on their high calling, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, for a boldness and a strength, Lord, uh, that you would strengthen them emotionally, Lord, as they raise their sons and daughters, Lord. You would strengthen the family, Lord. You would strengthen the marriage and the husbands, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We, we lose a blessing on them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 
there are, as you're seated, there are seasons to life, and mothers go, are, are in, all the mothers in this room are, some of them are different seasons than others. Some of them have newborn children, some of them have children that just got married off and moved away. Some of them have children in college. Just different seasons of life in the life of a mother brings different challenges, different whatevers. And that's what we just prayed for because God goes with us through every season. Um, I just want to say that God, whenever I know I'm going to be preaching, the way the Lord speaks to me is he just gives me a title. This is the title he gave me, Above and Beyond. He gives me the title first, and then as I'm praying and preparing, he builds on the title. I don't know how well you can see that. It's a picture of part of the universe. But all the songs today that, that were sung in worship, the scripture reading, everything, half of that is in my notes. Some of the songs we sing are in my notes. Um... And I, I believe especially that God wants to strengthen us today. It's one thing to worship him. It's one thing to sing to him. It's one thing to hear his word. But he wants us to become one with him in the spirit today. To become united with him. To not just sit and listen to another sermon, but to, to open up our heart's door and open up our spirit's door. Because God wants to infuse strength in his church today. And I just believe that God's going to do that. Um, so let's pray that this isn't just a sermon, but that it, God will do what he intended on doing when he gave me this. I'm just a mouthpiece. I'm just an oracle. God could use anybody. But he uses his word. So let's pray that his word would do the work that he sent it to do. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your word and for the power of your word, Lord. I thank you for already setting the stage here this morning in our worship, Lord Jesus. I thank you, God, for the work that you want to do in our hearts and in our spirits here, Lord Jesus. God, that you want to infuse us with joy unspeakable and full of glory, that you want to strengthen your church today, Lord Jesus. You want to equip us with fresh strength, Lord, to go into this harvest, Lord, and to reap the unprecedented harvest that you have promised is on the way, Lord Jesus. Anoint me, Lord, that I can speak as your oracle, that I can minister with the ability that your spirit gives, Lord Jesus. Anoint the hearers today and let your word speak to us in Jesus' name. Above and beyond. We've all had people do things for us, and some of them have really gone the extra mile. Some of them have gone above and beyond the call of duty. Some of them have gone way beyond our expectations, way beyond what we even asked of them. And without naming any specifics, I'm sure as you think, you can, you can think of people that have done that for you, whether it was a financial gift, um, whether it was they opened the doors of their home to you, whether they gave you a car or whatever, they, they went above and beyond. And that's one thing in the human realm, in the natural realm. But today, God wants to remind us of where he is. He is above and he is beyond. God is above and God is beyond. Psalm 97.9, King David says, For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Notice the word gods is small g because there are no other gods. There are, Jesus, the Lord said, I, I know uh, no other gods besides me. There aren't any more. But because man has manufactured false gods and idols, the Lord has to specify, well, okay, this is how you think. You think there's other gods, but just to make it clear, I'm exalted above all of them. If you don't want to believe there's only one, well, believe what you want, but I'm above all of them. Above and beyond. And then the next passage I want to read is kind of lengthy, but it's the foundation for this sermon, and it, it really gives a good description of God. 
It's in Psalm 90, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Is that a, oh, okay, we do have the New King James Version. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to read this and throw a few comments in as I read. But as I'm reading, picture this God in your heart. Picture him in your mind. Get a perspective of who God is. The God that lives inside of you. The God that made the earth. He says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Who measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Who weighed the mountains in scales in the hills in a balance? You know what? He knows how much Mount Everest weighs. I can picture God on creation day up there with a scale th and thinking, okay, I'm going to make Mount Everest now, and he's just dumping some soil on a scale, and I want it to weigh a little more. I want it to be a little taller. He, he puts some more soil on it, and he, he brings it up to the highest elevation on the face of the earth, and he just weighs it in a scale. He can tell you how much Mount Everest weighs. When that earthquake hit in Nepal, we're probably all familiar, Mount Everest suffered an avalanche. The highest mountain on earth, it was an avalanche, and it actually killed 17 or 18 people. But God knows the weight of Mount Everest. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or as his counselor has taught him? That's a pretty foolish notion, but the next verse says, With whom did he take counsel? And who instructed him? And taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. Japan, drip. China, drip. India, drip. The United States of America, drip. Russia, drip. All the nations, are as a drop in a bucket before God and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. He could cause a volcano to burst up and lo and behold, there's a new island just by God saying it's going to happen. It's happened. I just saw it on the Weather Channel, some aerial uh, footage of a brand new island that was born from a volcano he lifts up those islands like a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. Our God is so far above, so far beyond. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds an image. The goldsmith overspreads it with gold. And the silversmith casts silver chains. Look at this next verse. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution, if you can't afford gold and silver for your idol, make a cheaper version. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. So we've got expensive idols, we've got cheap idols, but they're all the works of man. What do, what do you worship that God didn't make? What, there's so many idols in our world that people craft and make. They, don't, they won't come right out and call it an idol, but they worship it as one. It could be their car, it could be their house, it could be their money. It could be whatever, but they're all, none, none of it can compare to God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. And spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Another passage 
the Lord told uh, someone, he said, heaven's my throne, earth is my footstool. You know, how are you going to build a house to house me in? God props his feet up on this planet. He's so much higher. He's so far above. He's so far beyond. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. I want to interject this right here. The U.S. Supreme Court is considering recently re redefining what God already put in place, marriage. And our world thinks that, well, if they say so, it's a new law. It's right. We've got to obey it. Guess what? That's a lie. It's not a new law. It's a new lie. And God, if they do that, in, the, in a good old USA, God will make the Supreme Court judges useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth. When he will also blow on them and they will wither. And the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me or whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. Talking about the stars. Calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord? And this is where some of our songs this morning came in. The creator of the ends of the earth neither faints nor is weary. Church, God wants to infuse you with new strength, with his strength, with his joy. Because I faint, I get weary, I get tired. But God wants to give you his strength. Another version of the scripture says he never slumbers or sleeps. Well, I'm not sure how accurate that version is. I'm going to go with this one that says he never faints nor is weary. Because I know in the New Testament, I can think of a story when Jesus did sleep. It was in the middle of a storm. It was when his disciples were in a boat and the waves were crashing and they were bailing the boat and they were freaking out thinking they were going to die. And what was Jesus doing? Sleeping on a pillow. They, they frantically woke up, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? Lord, we're going to sink. And, and I can picture Jesus rubbing his eyes and, and shaking his head saying, where's your faith? By the way, waves, wind, Calm down. I'm paraphrasing. It's a Tim Tremblay version. Calm down, waves. Calm down, wind. And there was a great peace. And, and they marveled. They woke up the creator to, to, to calm down the creation. So he did sleep. But this version says he never faints. He never gets weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives, again, the song we sing, Power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We sang it this morning. But God wants to get it past the song. He wants to even get it past his word. He wants to get it in your heart. He wants to get it in your spirit. He wants to infuse you with this strength. God is going to renew our strength today. If we could just put the title slide. Oh, actually, the other slides there with the, the mountains, the mountain and the sea. Again, these are going to go back and forth to, as I'm preaching to remind you of how far above God is, how far beyond God is. You know what? I'm wary of the devil's deceptive inferiority complex he's trying to put on me. I'm wary of his intimidation he's trying to uh, freeze me up with. I'm wary of the tolerance he's trying to 
put on Christians in this world. Uh, yesterday, uh, we were driving into Worcester, and I saw a bumper sticker. The bumper sticker says, I'm straight, but not narrow. And Nathaniel and I were thinking, what does that must mean? The only conclusion we could cam- come up with is, okay, sexually, they're straight. They're uh, man and woman. Uh, what's that word? Yeah, that one. They're heterosexual. Okay, they're straight, but they're not narrow. So in other words, if I interpreted that bumper, bumper sticker right, that means I'm not going to be narrow-minded and say, well, the other lifestyle's wrong. We have a tolerant society that doesn't want to call evil evil anymore. The Bible says, woe to them that call evil good and good evil. And I'm, I'm tired of the devil trying to back the church into a corner and say, you, you can't speak the truth. You, you can't confront sin you can't say what's wrong and what's right. This is 2015. Well, you know what? The Lord I serve is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's never going to change no matter what, what generation we're living in, no matter what laws get passed on what level of government. He's always the same. I'm tired of the devil trying to shut the mouth of God's witnesses. I don't know about you, but I'm going to submit to God. I'm going to resist the devil, and he's going to flee from me. I'm going to ignore and I'm going to dismiss his lies and his false accusations. You know what? When I put my sermon notes together, I do the spell check. And every time I do it, the word Satan comes up and they want me to capitalize it. I don't do it. I don't give him that honor. Even in my notes, you can look at my notes. Every time it says Satan, it's small s. Every time it says God, it's big G. Big J for Jesus. God is working in amazing ways and not just in the UPC. Uh, I work with a Baptist guy, um, and he told me a story. Well, I told him the story that Brother Shelton told us on that video about how, long story short, he was given $100,000. Remember that story? Shatwell? Shatwell, Brother Shatwell. Well, uh, God can even do things in other denominations, even if they don't have all the truth. And this Baptist man told me, uh, uh, debating on whether or not to tell you the location, but I I guess I will. It's the Quaybog Valley Baptist Church on 148 in Sturbridge, right past Tantasco High School. This guy I work with, uh, uh, him and I have talked extensively about the Lord. He knows a a lot about God, a lot about the Bible, but he doesn't have the Holy Ghost yet. And he told me that when uh, they used to rent uh, the old fire station in Sturbridge to stay in, and they, then they had other locations, and there came an opportunity of an old lumber yard went up for sale, a big building, and the pastor felt directed by the Lord to buy that lumber yard building and convert it into a church, into a sanctuary. So he just prayed, and he really felt like God told him to do that. So they put a bid on the property, on the buildings. There was two buildings, actually, a main one and then a, a good-sized secondary building, they put a bid on it, and they were so hopeful because, you know, God's just telling them, do this. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. And guess what? They were overbid by an antique dealer. And an antique dealer bought the property, totally renovated it. New plumbing, new electric, new windows, new roof, new floors. I think they repaved the parking lot. They, and and they, they had a, an antiques uh, store selling antiques until... There was a fire, and that second building burned to the ground. And then the antique store decided, you know what, we're just going to cut our losses and sell this property at a lower cost to the Baptist church. So the Baptist church got the property at a lower price than they originally bid for, and all the upgrades were paid for by the antique store. (laughs) One thing the Lord's been helping me with lately, and I believe he wants to help a lot of people in here with, he wants to fix our complex of ourselves. Not in a proud way, but in a true way. There's a difference between truth and pride. Pilate, when Jesus was before him, when he was being crucified, or he was about to be crucified, Jesus is standing right before Pilate. And Pilate says, what is truth? He's looking at truth personified. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Here's Pilate looking at 
truth manifested in the flesh and saying, what is truth? God wants to speak truth to our hearts today, the truth that's going to transform who we are, who we think we are. And I'm going to go through a few areas of our complex that, that God wants to adjust. And, and as I do this, I want to remind Satan that we're, the church is not auditioning for American Idol or any other idol. The church is not in the earth to put on a fashion show, to, to, to propose, uh, propose uh, impress anybody or perform for anybody. The church is here to fulfill the Great Commission. And when that is fulfilled, the church is leaving. But while the church is here, the accuser will try to mess up your thinking of who you are while you're here. So I'm going to hit a few areas because these are the areas that the world gets their sense of significance from. The world gleans their sense of importance from these areas. The world says, I'm somebody if I rate on any one of these scales. But I want to tell you today that you're, if you're in the church, if you're a Christian, you top all of these. You're above, you're beyond so far all of these compared to the world. First of all, God's people are the most rich people on the face of the earth. More rich than Donald Trump, more rich than any big name multi-billionaire out there, more rich than the f guy that owns Facebook there, whatever, I can't even pronounce his name. Yeah, him. More, you're more rich than he is. But in the world's eyes, you aren't because you don't have the same size bank account. You don't live in the same size mansion. You don't drive the same size Cadillac. But church, you are more rich because your riches come from God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, who owns the gold inside of those hills, who, who supplies all of your needs according to his riches and glory. So let the poor say, I am rich. Church, if you start realizing I am rich, I don't have to compare myself with anybody else on any other level of income or class in the world. I am the most rich person on the face of the earth in a humble way, in a true way. You also are the most powerful people on the planet, church. That's another thing that especially men seek um, you know, affirmation by is their level of power, how much authority they have, how many other people are under them. You, know, you could have 500 people under you, and all you are is a, the cemetery taker care of guy. <laughs> church, you are the most powerful because your power comes from Jesus. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the devil, and nothing shall by any means harm you. That's how powerful you are, church. Hallelujah. That's how powerful we are, devil. Church, you are the most beautiful people in all the world. And I'm not talking about the beauty of our American culture. I'm talking about the beauty of holiness. Holiness is the most beautiful beauty there will ever be. Modesty is the most beautiful thing that will ever be. We're living in a culture where people strip down naked. You may say, what do you mean naked? They're not taking all their clothes off. Well... I'm not going to go too far in this, but the Lord said in the Old Testament, if a woman exposes her thighs, she's exposed her nakedness. We're walking in a culture where people don't think anything of being walking around naked in their underwear. They just make it fluorescent orange instead. And they call it beauty. I call it lust. It is beauty, but it's in its wrong wrong uh it's it's out of god's design yeah. and if we're not careful in the church we can think well if i'm not that pretty or that attractive or that sexy or that whatever then i'm less no you're not church you are the most beautiful people on the face of the earth <laughs> and if the world spurns your holiness if the world spurns your modesty who cares 
We're not living for the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Your women, girls, your modesty and your beautiful long hair to God is, it reflects his glory. It reflects the glory of God. The church are the most beautiful people in all of the earth. The church is the most influential people on the planet. It was said, someone said it this morning about how, I think Brother Hanson said about how, you know, when he was talking about Hitler, how did, how did Hitler change his mind and go in a different direction? Because the church was praying. Because the church has influence in the world. Because the church can actually change the course of nations. God has told this church, we're going to affect this region, this nation, and this world. The early church turned the world upside down. Church, you are the most influential people on the face of the earth. More than any political figure, more than any government, more than any president or dignitary, you are the most influential people on the earth. But the devil doesn't want you to believe it. The devil doesn't want you to think it. The devil doesn't want you to remember it or understand it. He wants you to think, well, we're just those awkward, weird Christians that hide away during the week and we show up Sunday morning in a closed building and that's that's not who we are. You are the most influential people in the earth. You are the most knowledgeable people on the planet. This is a passage I didn't get the the reference, but it says this wisdom, talking about the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom that the Lord gives. This wisdom does not descend from above, the worldly wisdom, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, Confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The Lord himself said, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Church, you are the most knowledgeable people on the earth you are the wisest people on the earth and today God wants to fix something in somebody's thinking about who you are he wants to take that lie and that false accusation and purge it out of your mind because that's not who you are and when God does that he's going to do great exploits through you the church is the most blessed Do not be deceived, this is in James 1, my beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You are the most blessed people on the earth. You are the most rich, the most powerful, influential, knowledgeable people on the planet, the church is. I look at my life personally, and it amazes me how blessed I am. God gave me a wife. I'm favored. God gave me a house and other material possessions. I'm blessed. God gave me a daughter. The Bible says children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So I'm favored. I'm blessed. I'm rewarded all by God. And so are you. Hallelujah. Again, these are all things that the world, apart from God, are trying to attain and achieve. But it's not the real thing. And finally, we are the most protected people on the face of the earth. You are more protected than anyone else on the planet. And it's not military power or might. It's not military strategy that protects you as, as much as what God does. He might use that a little bit if he chooses to. But I remember back when Pastor Hart was pastor here and the Gulf War was happening. And uh, Iran or Iraq, one of the nations, was lobbing Patriot missiles over into Israel. And I remember in one service here in one of those older buildings, we were praying about that war And at the end of the service, the Lord spoke in tongues and interpretation. He told us, 
He said, if Israel would have believed, I would have had my angels catch those missiles in midair and throw them right back where they came from. Church, we are the most protected people on the earth. We have the blood of the lamb, so we're protected against the devil. We have the whole armor of God available to us. His helmet, his breastplate, his truth, his gospel, his word, his faith. You are the most protected people on the earth. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, the Bible says. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You have angels protecting you. Again, the world doesn't understand all this. They don't even see all this. They're thinking if we beef, beef up our military might, we'll be safe. Well, ironically, our country's decreasing our military might. So whenever you feel the opposite of any of these things, remember the, the, the opposite is true. If you're feeling poor, if you're feeling weak, if you're feeling stupid, if you're feeling ignorant, if you're feeling vulnerable, remind the devil, hey, hey, I'm not any of those. I'm all of these. You know, Jesus said he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Above and beyond, God is so far above. God is so far beyond. We don't even understand the whole picture yet. We don't even see it yet. But the devil sees a lot, and, and he tried to exalt himself. Way back in the beginning, before God even made us, made man. And he's going to try it again before his final doom. Isaiah 14 talks about how his first miserable failure. He said, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. This is Lucifer talking. He evidently forgot that God created him in the beginning, not as the devil, but as an angel to bring him glory. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. And that's where the devil ended up. When he tried to exalt himself above God, God knocked him down to the lowest place. And then, so the devil's been on the same mission ever since. He, he tried to get Adam and Eve, try to convince them, you're going to be like God if you'll just eat of this tree. And he's, he's going to do that right up to the end, Second Thessalonians, when the Antichrist, who is Satan's counterfeit savior, it says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So the devil knows that he's already deceived enough of the world to think there are optional other gods out there. But when he tries this move, he's going to say, you know what, I'm above all of them. I'm above Buddha. I'm above Allah. I'm above Muhammad. I'm above you fill in the blank. He's going to try to exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's what the devil is going to try to do before the Lord comes back and says the game's over. So in the meantime, the church is here. And we're serving a God who is so far above, so far beyond. You know, in the Old Testament, the Lord spoke to the nation of Israel and told them in Exodus 19, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. It was God's plan to exalt that nation of Israel above all the other nations on the earth. To raise them up to a place of prominence in the earth. And that's why Israel is such a target. That's why Israel is where the Antichrist is going to say he's God. 
because the devil knows this. But in the New Testament, there's a spiritual Israel. That is the church. That's you. That's me. And I want to show you where Jesus sits in Ephesians 1, starting at verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. See that counterfeit the devil's trying to do? He's going to say, the Antichrist thinks, well, I'm going to seat myself in the temple and, and say I'm above all other gods, that I'm God and people's going to worship me. He's just trying to do what Jesus already did. He was, Jesus was seated at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. That's where our God sits. That's where Jesus sits, so much far above all of the, all of the opposition, above all of the principalities and powers that you and I are fighting against. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In Ephesians 3, it tells us where the church sits now. Verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, that's what we are engaging in in these prevailing prayer meetings. We're fighting against these principalities. We're fighting against powers. We're fighting against rulers of the darkness of this world. We're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. But church, God has put us so far above all of them. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. That covers everything. According to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. We've heard that verse over and over, but I want to live what that verse says. That means whatever I think, whatever I ask, God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all of that. That's what it says. And it's according to the power that works in us. There is a power in the church. There is a power in you. If you have the Holy Ghost, that power is in you to do so much more, so far above all that you could ever ask or think. Ephesians 4, Jesus made the trip to hell and back. This is echoing what Bishop preached at district conference. One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Like Brother Hansen preached at district conference, Jesus went to hell and back. And now the church is making the same trip. 
But we're doing it with the power and the anointing of God. We're doing it with the authority in the name of Jesus. We're doing it with the blood of Jesus. Jesus descended all the way down to hell. And then he ascended all the way up to heaven. God wants to remind us that Jesus is above the church. He is above the fivefold ministry. He's above apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He's above all of them. He's the chief shepherd. He's the head of the church. He is above your trial. He is above your test. Look at the life of Job. God orchestrated everything that could have ever happened to Job because God was above it. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, whatever test or trial, God is so far above it. God is in control of it. He's above every devil you will ever face. He's above every devil you will ever fight. He's above the weather. He's above Mother Nature, Mother Earth. This irks me whenever I check the weather. There's never any reference to the Creator. There's never any reference to God. It's always oh, Mother Nature's up to this. Uh, Mother Earth is up to this. Well, if, if she really is your mother, she's upset. Okay, it's Mother's Day. Your mother is upset, uh, people of the earth. She's really mad. She's sending out hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes, earthquakes. Um, she's sending out lightning fires, and the earth is opening up into big sinkholes. Your mom is really mad. You better listen to her. Or she's going to call your daddy. <laughs> See, uh, how about it's Father Creator, Father, the one who made it all. You know what I think is happening is all creation is groaning, eagerly awaiting the revealing of the sons of God. It's either that or hell is expanding its borders. One of the two, I had that thought. I don't know how true it is, but the Bible does say somewhere that hell is expanding its borders. I don't know exactly where hell is, but if it's located in the heart of the earth, maybe hell is just getting bigger. So there's earthquakes, there's fires, there's volcanoes. I don't know, but I just know that the Bible says all creation is groaning. It's eagerly awaiting the revealing of the sons of God. God is so far above that. God is so far above my circumstance. He's so far above my sin and my addiction. Uh, our prayer group did a roadside cleanup a couple weeks ago around the church here, actually. And uh, my wife and I went on Cordis Road in in less than a mile. Well, first of all, we went out for 45 minutes and picked up seven bags of trash. But in less than a mile on Quarters Road, I picked up, I didn't count them, but I'm estimating probably 70 or 80 quart glass vodka bottles just thrown off the side of the road. And the other group members picked up hundreds of those little nip bottles all around the roads, all around this church. Our God is so far above addiction. God sees those people. God wants to reach those people. God wants to fill them with the power of the Holy Ghost. That they would not be drunk with wine, but that they would be filled with the Spirit. God is so far above every type of sickness and every type of disease. God is so far above and beyond Wall Street, above the Internet, above cyberspace. He's so far above all of it. We live down here in this realm. He's so far above it all. Uh, where I'm working lately, and we have break in the break room, every day they have a TV show on called The Squawk Box or something. It's, it's all about uh, Wall Street. It covers the activities of Wall Street every day. And it's called The Squawk Box because there's like three or four guys there that talk about how all the businesses are doing, and they, they really get worked up about it. I mean, they get mad, they fight, and everything. All of they're following money, and, and they all cheer and clap when the opening bell opens up and everything. You know what? God is so far above Wall Street. Our, our world puts so much stock in that, literally stock, get it? Um, God is so far above that. God could provide you with money that it's not even money. He could just provide your needs without money. He did it in the Bible. The widow... You know, with the cruise of oil, God didn't fill the, the vessels up with dollar bills and quarters. He just filled it up with oil and kept, kept it coming, kept it coming. He's so far above Wall Street. Philippians 2, 
verse 8, again, we sang about this. In being found in appearance as a man, Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, it was said this morning, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. He's so far above. And now I want to close a little bit before we pray and talk about how far, how far beyond God is. He's above and he's beyond. But as we do, let's pause and pray again because I don't want this to just be, I know I've read a lot of scripture. I'm letting the Bible speak for itself. But I, I do believe God wants to do a work in our hearts. So let's pray before I close and and again, open the door of your heart. You've opened your mind and your ears, but let God get past that into your spirit. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, it's not by our might or by our power, but it's by your spirit, Lord Jesus. God, this work that you will do in your church is so far and above and beyond what we've ever experienced, what we have ever seen or heard, what the world has ever seen or heard. I pray, Lord, that the work that you want to do in us today, that you can do that, Lord, through the working of your mighty power, Lord Jesus, that you can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we're asking you or all that we're thinking, Lord Jesus. God, let your word perform the work that you sent it to do here this morning. Let it transform our minds and our hearts and our spirit, Lord. Take us out of the realm that we've been living in and bring us to where you have called us to walk, Lord Jesus. God, that we open up our heart's door to you. We open up our spirit to you, Lord Jesus. We want to give you access, God, to the very inner man, to who we are, God, not just on the outside, but, but who we are on the inside. We want to become one with you in the spirit, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord, in Jesus' name. He's so far beyond. In Jeremiah 5, do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence, who has placed the sand as the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it? And though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. God can stop three, the earth is covered three quarters of the way with water, and God can restrain it with sand. God can, God can stop those mighty waves with sand. Jesus walks on the sea. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. You feel like anything's against you? Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and they marveled. How, when's the last time God amazed you beyond measure? When's the last time you marveled at what God could do? <laughs> Jesus heals a deaf mute. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took them aside from the multitude and put his finger in, in his ears. And he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epathra, that is, be open. Immediately his ears were opened. And the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. I believe that Jesus wants to astonish and amaze this world again. Not for a show, but to show his power. 
to show his might. In closing, as you stand and come to the altar, what does God have in store for you? What does God have in store for me? What does God have in store for this church beyond our fear? Hallelujah. Beyond your unbelief, what does God have waiting? What does God have waiting beyond your doubt and beyond your worry, beyond complacency, beyond lethargy and apathy? What is on the other side of all of that that God wants to bring? Is it a miracle? Is it a gift of faith? Is it a sign? Is it a wonder? Is it a great exploit? What does God have prepared beyond those things? Some of, our, uh, some of our thoughts need healing. Some of the way we think needs healing. I'm in the midst of a strange and fiery trial, you might say. I'm being tempted on every side. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. In that, in that middle of that fiery trial, he is forging something. What is beyond the trial that you're facing? What is beyond the test? If, if, it could be a financial test. It could be a physical test. It could be a whatever test. But God has something beyond it. God has a purpose in it. But my thoughts are confusing. My thoughts are scattered. They're unfocused. They're distracted. I can't sleep. You know what? He understands our thoughts from afar off. He understands where your thoughts originate from. He understands what track your train of thought is running on and where that train is going to bring you. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Some of us need some healing in our thinking. He understands the source of your thoughts. Some of, some of you, your thoughts are based, you don't even, you're not even aware of it. But God wants to show you your thoughts the foundation of your thoughts are fear. Every thought is somehow tied to fear. Or it could be shame. It could be guilt. It could be worry. It could be unbelief. There was a time when Jesus was ready, willing, and able to do so many mighty works. But he couldn't because of their unbelief. What does God have beyond your unbelief? What does God have above your fear? What does God have above your circumstance? He wants to transform your mind today if you will let him. If you will give him access to your mind. If you will say, Lord, I want to love you with all of my mind. I want you to fix my thinking, Lord. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. But I've sinned. I've failed again. I've fallen short. I'm a loser. I messed up. I made a mistake. I looked at something I shouldn't have looked at. I said something I shouldn't have said. I did something I shouldn't have done. I went somewhere I shouldn't have went. I watched something I shouldn't have watched. I'm a sinner. Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know what? We're living in the days like it was in Noah's day. But you know what Noah found? He found grace. And where sin abounds like it is in our day, grace does much more abound. So far above all the sin is grace. So far beyond all the addiction is grace. God's grace always precedes his impending judgment. So as you begin to pray, 
as you begin to open your heart to the Lord and respond to his word. Let him get into your mind. Let him get into your spirit. Let him get into your heart. Let him get beyond the surface. Let him get beyond the superficial. Let him get beyond whatever barriers are in your life. What, he, what is beyond the broken barrier that God has for the church? What's beyond the crumbling walls that God said are falling? What's beyond all of the fighting that we're doing against the enemy? What kind of unprecedented harvest does God have above and beyond everything? Hallelujah, Jesus. Just talk to the Lord. Open your heart to him. Open your mouth to him. Open your mind to him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, I just pray, God, that your word would transform our thinking, Jesus. God, that it would be more than just print on a paper, but it would be something that would change who we are, Lord Jesus. That it would change the way we think and see ourselves, Lord. That you can bring us so far above where we are, so far beyond. That we don't have to dwell in the mediocre or the lukewarm. That we don't have to dwell, Lord, in a realm of unbelief or doubt, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Keep talking to him. God's going to do something tonight above and beyond also if we'll let him. God's going to do something next week above and beyond if we'll let him.